Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 231, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with the host of Computer Chronicles himself, Mr. Stuart Chaffet. In this part of the interview, we talk about the impact that video games have had on the computer industry. I think you'll be surprised by Stuart's response. And then we hear a lot of fun behind the scenes stories about the antics that some of Stuart's guests got up to. A lot of great stuff. I think you're going to get a real a big kick out of those. And then we, uh, Stuart also responds to uh, questions submitted by you guys. So, a lot of really great stuff in this episode. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Stuart Chaffet. So, I was, you know, I was going back and looking at some of the episodes about where you cover the games. And yeah. I saw the one with the Defender of the Crown. Yeah. I was wondering uh, if you could just mention a few, a few of these games that really just wowed you and you thought, okay, this is, there's been a leap here. Well, the, the most impressive thing I guess I ever saw was the first 3D shooter. And I can't remember the name of it right now. Maybe you do. Uh, Doom? No, it was or before Wolfenstein Doom. 3D. Which one? Or Wolfenstein uh, 3D? Maybe it was Doom, actually. It might have been Doom. But I remember fir first seeing that, you know, the 3D world in which you go behind things and in front of things and navigate. I mean, that was an eye-opener for me. I mean, this, this 3D animation I thought was was incredible because that really put you in a very realistic world, which I had never seen before. Uh the other thing, I mean, there's some games, I mean, one of my favorite games of all time nobody's probably ever heard of was called Robot Wars. You know this game? Robot Wars, I... Robot Not Wars. Any bells. Written, sounds... Robot Wars. <laughs> written for the Apple... Uh, well, it's one of the great games. Uh, I'll tell you why I think it's great. Because it's an intelligence game. It's not a reflex game, you know, with the boom, 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 boom. You had, you had a set of robots, and the computer had a set of robots. And you had to program your robots to have a strategy balance of offense and the balance of defense. And then after you programmed your robots, you put them in a ring with the computer's robots to see who would win the battle. You just sat there and watched your programming work or not work. Nobody's ever really done a newer version of that game. I can't believe it. I look for it all the time. Uh, but that was, to me, a brilliant, brilliant game because I'm not the biggest fan of you know real-time shooters. Uh, maybe I'm just too old for that. I don't know. But th there's some games were just the intelligence in the game was so much. First, uh, certainly the, the 3D shooters, just from a technology point of view, were brilliant. Um, trying to think of some of the other things I thought were fantastic. Um, looking at some of my notes here. Do you play any role-playing games or adventure games? I, I did play. I mean, I did Myst. Myst, Myst of yeah. course. I, can, you know, I, did, yeah, I did that kind of stuff. I mean, when they, they got a little too complicated for me at some point, I think. Uh, and you got sort of tired of the same gimmicks. But, yeah, I love, love the adventure role-playing games. Uh, but I love the, the sort of intelligent – I mean, I loved Lemmings because you really had to think through that. I mean, you had to really figure out how to solve these. I love problem-solving games. Um, what else? I love some action games. I mean, Tomb Raider was, you know, a great fun game at the time. Uh, what else? I'm an old fan back in the Atari of Pitfall. I thought that was a fun game. Um, I love to do, you know, Half Life was a big favorite of mine. Uh, but other sort of intelligent games like Incredible Machine. I don't know if you remember that. We had to oh, like, sure. yeah. build things. I mean, that was a great game to me. Um, what else? I don't know if you remember a game called Gadget. No, I don't think so. Gadget. That was a that was a pretty damn. I still I still have actually boxes of. CD, I mean, hundreds of CD games, hundreds of five and a quarter inch floppies, three and a half inch floppies with my games. I, I can't part with them, even though it's hard to get them to play on most machines these days. Uh, but yeah, I, I think any time sort of a game up the ante in terms of what you could do or what it looked like or what it felt like, uh, that's sort of what, what turned me on. I liked, a lot, I liked a lot of the sports simulation games, frankly, because I think that was pretty cool where you could sort of live in this fantasy of being a uh, virtual athlete in a world that you could probably never otherwise get into. Uh, what else? Um, Spycraft was a favorite of mine. I, like, I have to remember Spycraft. Um, there was a game called Battle Chess. I don't remember that. Which oh, I, sure, Battle which Chess. Which was kind of cool. Uh, that I thought was fun. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds of titles. I actually put together... I finally decided I had to figure out what it is I have because I have so much stuff. I created just this gigantic database of all the game software I have now. 
And I'm still sort of putting that all together because I got all these different platforms from, you know, three and a half to five and a quarter to CD to DVD. Uh, and I, I don't know what to do with all this stuff. It's so precious. But I mean, of course, it's a whole different world now. I mean, now you play on the iPhone. It's, I mean, it's a different world of games today, which is pretty cool, too. One thing I wanted to talk about, you know, I've had a lot of game developers on the show, game yeah. designers, and a lot of the times uh, they'll have a game that doesn't do as well as they thought it should. Right. And usually they'll say that's because of piracy and the, all the pirates that were out there with the bootlegs. Uh, you know, kind of wondering what's your perspective on that? Well, funny you should mention that. When I was just digging up before, I found all these. <laughs> Remember the wheels? <laughs> oh, yes. I remember not so fondly. <laughs> yeah, Rick. Oh, my God. That was the most hated thing of all. I don't, I don't know. I don't think that's an issue these days. I think once upon a time it was an issue. Um, How widespread do you think it was? Piracy? Oh, very widespread. Uh, sure, I mean, just, I mean, still is today. It may not be in games as much anymore, but music, I mean, in the digital world is so easy to steal stuff and copy stuff. And it's hard to, hard to convince a 15-year-old that you shouldn't get a free copy of something. Um, but I don't think piracy doomed any particular software title. I mean, look, there were a lot of successes, even though you, you might have been able to steal the stuff. Uh, but I think that culture changed. I mean, in the earlier days, I think piracy was a bigger problem than it is today. Um, I don't think that's an excuse. I mean, if a game is hot, a game is hot. Uh, and it makes it whether you I mean, anybody who really wants to can steal anything. Uh, you could say the same thing about movies or TV shows. I mean, the piracy is rampant. But people still make a lot of money doing that kind of stuff. I was wondering, I probably should have checked for this. <laughs> you must have had some guests on that were selling the copy protection stuff, right? Or Yeah. Maybe some uh, of the folks that were selling the copying programs to hack the copy yeah, protection. Yeah, both. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, copy protection was universally hated. I mean, I, I, I hated it so much, I almost refused to play something that, that had this complicated copy protection on it. But it was a tough, it was a tough time. I mean, people were stealing intellectual property. There's no question about it. I mean, I frankly have the same problem with Computer Chronicles. I mean, YouTube is full of unauthorized Computer Chronicle shows. What am I going to do? I mean, it's, it's just in this digital world, you just, you, you just have to live with it. And I've just sort of I have to flip my mentality and say, this is just great free promotion and I'm not going to worry about it. Um, and I think that's the way, if you're smart, you really just have to think. You just cannot fight this battle, I think, in the digital world. It's simply too easy to copy stuff. Uh, just take it as a compliment, not as a threat. Is that how you feel about Abandonware too? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. I think that's a that's a kind of different different subject. Um, I mean, there's different. Tell me exactly what you mean. The different versions, different ways of interpreting Abandonware. Like you know, you're talking about you had all these five you know games on five and a quarter inch discs and so on. Yeah. You know, you could, it's pretty easy to find an emulator program online for right. something like the Apple II or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And just uh, grab all those ROMs and play them without ever thinking twice about paying money to whoever might actually, even, even if you could figure out who actually yeah, owns yeah. the copyright to this stuff. Uh, right. You know, some people say they would never play any of that stuff because it's a copyright uh, violation. But, you know, how else are you going to play it? Yeah, I mean... I, I, I honestly, it doesn't bother me that much. I mean, if they were good games, they made their money. It's a different world now. You just you just can't protect stuff the way you did before. I think. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I look. I was a big fan of uh, you know all the all the early music sites. You know, which you were stealing music. I didn't. It was just fun, you know, <laughs> to have access to that stuff. I mean, it's wrong, I grant you that, but if you're talking to your average 16-year-old, it's not wrong. All right, so why don't we get into some of these hilarious failed demonstrations. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it must have been such a, I could imagine, you talk about these people coming in and their sweat beating on their forehead. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it must yeah, have just yeah. been... <laughs> Uh, really chaotic. I don't know. I've got you gave me several examples of of um. Well, the classic one was the Peter Norton example. I mean, you, you know, you got these big shot experts come in, and with with Peter, we were showing off. I guess it was Disc Doctor at the time. You know, the big revelation was that when you erase something or delete something, you don't really delete it. It's still sort of sitting there, and you can resurrect it. So we had a demonstration uh, with with Peter Norton in which we 
deleted a bunch of things. And we said, Peter, can you bring these back? Oh, yeah, no problem. And he's pressing buttons and pressing buttons. And the sweat is pouring down because he can't figure this out. He crashes the entire computer. This is live now. I mean, this was, this was way early on in the, in, the, in the Computer Chronicles era when we didn't really re, re tape things very much. And uh, we also, you know, had ter- certain time limits as to what we could do. And he was embarrassed. I mean, this was the guy, Peter Norton, you know, in his big utility. And he was doing more damage than solving any problem. I mean, that was a classic one. Another classic one I think I mentioned to you was with, with the PS2, in fact. We had John Dvorak on. And he was saying, oh, this is a great modular computer. You just plug all these things down, you plug it back in, and he took the computer apart, and he could not figure out how to put it back together again. And he was sweating, too, like, how do you do this damn thing? So, I mean, you had both on the hardware side and the software side. You know, in those days, a lot of stuff was, was kind of complicated. So uh, the other one I told you about was the funniest one, was the, the first colored laser printer. When Xerox came out with it, this was a big deal, I mean, a color laser printer. And I don't know if you remember, they, they, they had a sample piece of output they came up with. Was this sort the of, Xerox guys, right? Yeah, 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 Xerox. Uh, and there was this, this sort of monkey of some sort that came out. And the color was absolutely brilliant. The resolution was brilliant. So they were going to actually print this thing out. And so they come in with the color printer. I didn't realize it. The thing, as I told you, it was the size of a Volkswagen. And they brought it in on two crates, this color printer. It was immense. And it took, they had like four technicians wiring things up and plugging things up because they were going to show this great new thing, the color laser printer. And this, fortunately, this was before we were actually taping. They just wanted to do a, a test run on the printer. And the guy pressed print and literally steam and smoke started coming out of this thing. And noises were going. It was just so embarrassing. And all these sec- Xerox technicians running around saying, oh, my God, what happened? They eventually figured out whatever the problem was. I don't remember. And they put the event, thank God, when we actually put it on the show, they pressed print, and this gorgeous piece of copy came out. But that was one of the most spectacular blow-ups, because you don't usually get smoke coming out of a computer. That sounds like my print. What is it about printers that <laughs> yeah, they just, yeah. even after all these years, you know, it just seems so hit or miss if you can actually print something? Well, they've got mechanical stuff there. That's the problem. You still have mechanics you got to deal with. I mean, that was one another example. Uh, what are some of the other ones? I mean, the classic problems you used to have were things like... Uh, uh, speech programs, artificial speech, and voice recognition. I mean, it's really funny. I go back and look at some of those shows from 25 years ago, and we have the same problems today. I mean, they really haven't gotten very far in these things. I mean, it's, it's an interesting, te- challenging technology, but we would spend hours. We did shows on you know, MIDI music things, and those things would never work the first time around. I remember one time we were in the studio until like 10 o'clock at night, you know, trying to get some of these music demonstrations working. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we were dealing with those sort of bleeding edge stuff, and sometimes, you know, really wasn't ready for prime time, and we were trying to put it on TV, and so we, we had a lot of crashing going on. You also mentioned a really <laughs> interesting story about a blind guy. Oh, that was fascinating. Yeah. We did, we did a show on computers and the disabled, and we were trying to show at the time this was actually, we had a Macintosh there, and somebody had come out with a software program to help blind people use a Mac, so it automatically read what was typed onto the screen so a blind person could hear it. So we had the Mac on the set, and one of our guests was a blind guy who was going to demonstrate this program, and we couldn't get it to work. And here's Gary Kildall sitting around, I'm sitting around, some other smart guy was sitting around, and the blind guy was sitting around. And we're all trying to figure out how to get this damn thing to work what's wrong. And the blind guy pops and says, wait a minute, I can hear the problem. I can hear the way the hard drive is spinning, that this is not right or that's not right. And it was fascinating to realize that the disabled guy was more able than we were. Because his hearing was so sensitive, he could actually hear it. We actually had another guy who could actually look at a CRT and tell you what the scan rate was. He could actually see it. He was so sensitive to that. So, I mean, we had... I mean, that was just fascinating to really make you rethink some assumptions in your life that somebody who's supposedly disabled is more sensitive to a certain kind of data than you are. So that was, that was a great one. What else? Uh, you had some fun with, or Gary had some fun with a ping pong robot. Oh, well, that was, <laughs> that was great. 
We, it sounds uh, like America's Funniest Home Videos material. It was pretty, pretty funny. Yeah, so they, we had on the show, uh, you know, we tried to do mechanical stuff. We had robots and stuff. Some guy had invented this automatic ping pong player. So it was a real ping pong table, and you had a human on one side and this robot on the other side that would catch the ball and then hit it back at you. And this was fortunately Gary, not me, in his demonstration playing the game. And Gary hit the ball, and this robot smashed his ball right into his crotch. And Gary, ah! <laughs> that was very, very funny. Not to Gary, but it was very funny to everybody. This, you know, we, we, that was not a big success, that robot ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could have blinded people also, in addition to, in addition to castrating people. Oh, well, my understanding, you've got this huge collection. You mentioned the software, all these platforms, yeah. and you said you practically have a museum. Uh, I know, do. Are you serious about the, the museum part? I mean, can people come over and, and look at this uh, stuff? Well, I don't, yeah, I mean, you know, talk about gaming platforms. I have the original Magnavox Odyssey. I don't know if you know what, I have the Fairchild gaming system. These were the two very first gaming systems. I have the original Pong game. You know, in which and it was really funny. This was on, I guess it was the, I don't remember if it was Fairchild or Magnavox. It was basically one game, and this white square went from left to right. And the game, you had these little plastic overlays you could put on your TV screen. And so every time you played a new game, it was the same two squares, but they played a different role depending on what plastic layer you put on the screen. Uh, and this stuff was brilliant. And I mean, I still have these, these two games and they work. Uh, I mean, that goes way, way, way back. Uh, you know, I still have my Atari 2600. I've got, I've got all, all this stuff. And I still have all my Atari games right here. <laughs> so, I mean, these are great games too. I've got Freeway. I don't know if you remember that game. I love that game. Uh, Pac-Man, of course. Asteroids, of course. Breakout, of course. E.T. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hubert, which was a great... So, I mean, I've got all this junk and I really should... I've offered some of this stuff, actually, to the Computer Museum in California and they, they, they didn't want it, so I don't know why. But I have don't to, want it. Maybe I have to start my own museum. I still have... One of my favorite pieces is I have the original laptop computer which is the HP Portable. I mean, a brilliant, brilliant machine, which still works. Uh, and I remember I was sitting on an airplane using this thing. Nobody had ever seen a laptop before. People, what, what is that? You know, what is that thing? Uh, so that's, that, that's a pretty cool piece of equipment I have, too. So, yeah, I do. And I've got a drawer full of handheld devices. I was a big fan on, on little things. So I've got the Newtons, and I've got the HP Go, and I've got the original... Uh, BlackBerry before it was a phone when it was just a messaging device. I've got a ton of these things and I don't know what to do with them. And it's a shame to just have them sit there. Maybe I have to build a vir maybe I need to build a virtual museum online. Well they could kind of fit in with your computer chronicles theme, you know. The <laughs> yes. Right. Come see the, the museum. Yeah, I gotta think about that one. I also I guess we uh you know in wrapping up here. Well, actually, I got a question that a fan submitted. Go ahead. Uh, so this is uh, Michael Bratkowski, the film operator, mm -hmm. camera operator. And so he wants to know what your thoughts are on this whole net neutrality issue. Oh, boy, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. Um, I'm kind of a fan of net neutrality, basically. I mean, on the other hand, if, you know, or I were Comcast or Verizon, I can kind of see their point of view that uh, – I mean, the use of the net has changed so much now that we have video. It's a different ball game. And, you know, do you have to treat the guy who's doing email the same as the guy who's downloading on Netflix? That's a different breed of user. So I can see from the provider's point of view, they want to be able to charge more. On the other hand, I think the principle of net neutrality, that everybody has equal access, I think trumps that. So, I mean, the Internet, you know, most spectacular development in human culture probably ever in terms of what it does for sharing information to tamper with that put it in the hands of a couple of big companies i think is dangerous and as these companies get bigger and bigger and consolidate and you have only a handful of companies i think it's a little scary to give them too much control of how you run it i think that needs some government protection and regulation to keep it a, a level playing field it's a close call but i'd be on the side of net neutrality Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, what are your thoughts on the future? I mean, where do you think we're headed? 
you know, five, ten years from now, what's what's well, the computing landscape going to look like? Yeah, I mean, the biggest challenge in the future is the user interface. I mean, using a keyboard is ridiculous, obviously. I mean, that's going to go away. And even touching iPads and stuff, I mean, that's that's an, to some degree, I mean, you can do some things better with touch than you can with a keyboard. But I mean, the fact that I'm staring at this QWERTY keyboard right now is ridiculous. I mean, that's a typewriter. I mean, that, that model for an interface has is, is got to go. I think we need uh, pattern recognition, speech recognition. And what's clearly coming is being able to talk to your computer like we, you and I can talk. I mean, to have the intelligence that can understand and see things. Uh, pattern recognition, I think, is one of the interesting, interesting challenges. People are doing a lot right now with face recognition. I always think, for instance, if I'm at the airport waiting for my luggage to come on the carousel, what my brain is doing there, you know, I'm looking at, a thousand pieces of luggage, and my brain is looking for that perfect match with what I know is my suitcase. You got to get a computer to do that. I mean, to get that level of, of pattern recognition, speech recognition is a little bit easier now. Uh, I think the big challenge is the interface. I think the next challenge is really 3D. I mean, to really get beyond the two dimensional world, uh, you know, whether it's holograms or whatever it is, you know, the technology is basically there. Um, you know, computers are pretty damn smart now. I think the challenge is the interface, how you talk to the computer and how the computer talks back to you. Next great challenge is, I think, artificial intelligence. I mean, thinking computers, you know, computers that can deduce uh, everyday, everyday things and, and, and listen to you. And there's, I mean, I remember way back, I don't know if you remember the program Eliza. Oh, sure. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Rogerian <laughs> shrink. I mean, that was pretty damn good. I think we have to get, you know, we'll, we'll get to that phase where that really works a little bit better. So I think user interface number one, getting away from, you know, primitive forms of input, uh, adding a third dimension in some form or another, uh, artificial intelligence, um, and, you know, the, the next level of quantum computing or wherever it happens to be, we really can, you know, by, by a, a large factor, increase the capabilities. Uh, or you look at things like, uh, you know, IBM's Watson. I mean, that was a pretty impressive demonstration, you know, when they were on Jeopardy. Uh, and, and certainly there are, you know, scientific areas in which computers, I mean, already we're doing, you know, a lot of uh, pharmaceutical lab work is not done in the real lab anymore. It's done in the computer because you can simulate, you know, a million reactions in a minute versus spending 10 years to do it in the lab. So I think the ability of using computers in, at the industrial level are maybe more important than the personal level. I think for you and me using a, quote, personal computer, I think the, big, the biggest challenge is games, really, <laughs> because once again, that's where you can play with the technology most. But I'd say, yeah, user interface, artificial intelligence, uh, pattern recognition, voice recognition, um, I think the next things we have to look at. So you don't worry about the, the singularity when the robots take over? Uh, I look forward to it. <laughs> I think that'd be damn fun to be, to, to talk to Hal, you know, and and see how smart they get. No, I'm not. Uh, um, I think it'd be damn interesting. I, I just want to be around when that happens. I think it'd be pretty fun to have a computer that smart. Well, Stuart, do you have any final thoughts or is there anything you would like to plug or something we haven't mentioned? Uh, nothing I really want to plug except uh, what great fun this is. I mean, I just feel so lucky to be alive during this period of time when the computer revolution came about, when the internet revolution came about. Um, Handheld devices came about. I mean, this is the most exciting time in science history to me. I mean, we're seeing things, I mean, people couldn't have dreamt of 100 years, couldn't have imagined 100 years ago. So I think this is such an exciting time to be alive and, alive and to be involved in these things. Uh, I, I, just, I just get off on it. I think it's just so much fun to watch this stuff. Uh, I get a little frustrated when things get a little boring. As a matter of fact, you know, when we stopped Computer Chronicles in 2002, things got a little boring. I mean, software wasn't the same as it was before. I mean, yeah, software was a, was a big business. You walked into a store and you had lots of choices. That sort of died down. I think the innovation died for a while until we got into handheld devices. Uh, but watching this stuff, and, you know, the Internet, obviously, and, you know, mobile device. I mean, the iPhone miracle, you know, the iPad. You know, I think, in fact, in retrospect, Steve Jobs will be remembered more for the tablet computer and for the iPhone than for computers. I mean, the Mac is interesting, but the tablet and the iPhone will really, really break through devices to me. I mean, that's where his brilliance and, and vision really came out. 
Uh, taking those to the next step, what that will be, uh, I don't know. But that's a, I mean, I walk down the, you know, the aisle of the airplane and, you know, half the people on the plane are using iPads. I mean, that's extraordinary. And what you can do, I mean, you know, I don't know if you know, but, you know, the, the airlines are dumping all their in-flight entertainment systems now because people have their own entertainment system if they're carrying around their, their device. So, yeah, this is, it's really fun to watch this. And there's nothing to me more exciting than the new technology stuff that happens. I mean, that just really excites me. So I, I look forward to every day and figuring out what the next great thing will be. And maybe we'll come back and do a TV show about that. Yeah, the next big thing is going to be, doesn't look like it's going to be the Wii U. No, <laughs> I don't think so. I'll tell you what I'm a big fan of, though, which is the Xbox Connect. That's a brilliant piece of technology. Uh, I always met Matt. I just bought the newest version of. I think it's called Fitness Evolved on the Connect. I mean, this is this is fantastic technology where the computer can look at you and analyze what you're doing. Uh, I, I don't think people have paid enough attention to this Connect idea that where the computer can see you and give you feedback on what you're doing. I mean, it's just. So I mean, you're coming at this from more of a that, that freaks you out position, or uh, this is really cool? No, I think it's really cool. It doesn't freak me out at all. Uh, it's incredible that I mean, I was just playing with this a couple of days ago. I just bought the newest version of this thing, Fitness of Arm. You know, you still have a personal trainer who really watches you exercise and says, "No, no, that's not so good." I mean, that really is a pretty big step forward. Where you can have a computer that can see you and analyze what you are doing. I mean, that's a great example in terms of an exercise fitness trainer situation so it's you know it's more important than just the game part of it but that's a pretty big step i don't think people are paying attention to matter of fact i'll tell you a little secret uh you know nielsen which you know measures television viewership i mean they they're they're adding the connect technology to their little boxes so they can actually watch you watch tv I and mean, that's a scary aspect i mean that's into nsa type stuff but that's that's pretty impressive technology that I don't think people are paying enough attention to. The fact that the computer can look at you, that's pretty new. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a new retrospective or a review. I haven't quite made up my mind yet what game I want to cover, so if you got ideas for things you'd like to see on the show, please let me know in the comments. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much, guys. Thank you so much if you have supported this show, uh, either by telling your friends about it or by supporting it uh, monetarily through Patreon. Uh, that's a really cool site. I've told you about it now for a couple weeks. So if you haven't heard of Patreon, go uh, to matchshot.us. Follow those links there. I think you'd be really impressed with what you see. It's a lot more fun than just using PayPal. Uh, but if anyway, you guys want to contribute to the show, I thank you very much. All I ask is just uh, $1 uh, per episode if you like Matchat and want to keep it on the air. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, also, just a reminder, I've got the uh, Vintage Games console book. Uh, I've got a few copies left of this, so if you'd like a copy, a signed uh, copy from me, just send uh, $50 over PayPal. Uh, let me know that you want the book, and uh, if you want it signed a special way or anything, and your address, and I'll get it in the mail to you. So only a few copies uh, left. Uh, otherwise, if you want to get the book on Amazon uh, and have it sent to me, uh, we can do it that way. So basically, as long as you cover the shipping and handling, uh, I'm fine. I think you'll really enjoy the book, and I'm really eager to hear some reviews of it. So uh, if you do have a copy, uh, let me know what you think. All right, so what about that ale of the week? Well, uh, this week I've got a very appropriately themed ale, a cabin fever. It's just, you know, it's just been a horrible, horrible winter here in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Freezing below zero temperatures for months now, feels like. I've barely been able to get out. Uh, of the house without being in pain from the cold. So definitely feeling the cabin fever. Uh, this is a brown ale from the New Holland Brewing Company. Those guys are out of uh, Holland, Michigan. Uh, so not too far away. Uh, let's see, a little write up about the beer. 6.5%, so no, not, not bad. Uh, 17 degrees Plato, I need to figure out what that means at some point. It says it pairs well with roasted meats or dried fruits, uh, so we'll see. Supposedly has hints of rye, roast, and raisin with a subtle caramel sweetness. So, anyway, sounds good. So let's get this open and see what it's all about. 
All right, so I've got some of this cabin fever here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, it's been smelling this. It's really, really nice. Uh, you definitely smell that sort of chocolatey, uh, raisiny-like smell they were talking about. It smells like it's going to be a really good uh, brown ale. It almost sounds, uh, smells sort of like a, like a stout uh, to me. A little bit of a, a chocolatey, like coffee-like smell to it. But anyway, let's give it a taste. Mm. Uh, nice and thick. A really good flavor on this. Uh, very sweet, very light. A little bit of that sort of chocolatey peanut butter-like taste to it. Uh, not, not really tasting any raisins, but I really like the way this tastes. I'll definitely try this again. Yeah, this is a, <laughs> a really, really good one. Um, just the flavor, really, it's a very attractive flavor. It's uh, not overpowering. Uh, they didn't overdo it with the hops. It's just a very smooth, sort of uh, chocolatey, uh, caramel-like taste. Uh, just the right amount of thickness here. Uh, just, you know, a lot of flavor packed into this. I, I'm really, uh, re really enjoying this one. <sighs> yeah, just all around really, really good, uh, good choice here. I'm uh, pleasantly surprised. I wasn't expecting a whole lot out of this, but uh, they've really blown me away with this. Um, it's somewhere between a four and a five, I think. So I feeling like a little generous today. So I'll go ahead and go for a full five out of five on this. Uh, definitely one of the best uh, brown ales I've had in a while. I uh, just can't complain about it at all. Uh, they've really balanced out those flavors and it's <laughs> really good stuff. So uh, go ahead and check out the Cabin Fever. If you see this sitting on the shelf somewhere. All right, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And the uh, quotation I was looking for uh, had to do with predicting the future. And I found this one from Alan Kay, a founder of the, a father of uh, object-oriented programming, as well as the windowing graphical user interface. And it goes something like this. To predict the future, you have to invent it. See you guys next week. Trip on, on the business side, what do you look for for a successful software game? Well, I think Pinball Construction Set has a lot of the things that you look for, and that's why it's, it's now one of the top ten sellers in the country, according to Billboard magazine. Uh, we have a philosophy of having products that are simple, hot, and deep. <clears throat>